the conservation and the management of urban heritage needs the efforts from all fields, not only in the hands of single groups. That's why we gather here today to bring practitioners, policy advisors, academics, and professionals to stimulate dialogues between them and between us. We have invited seven experts to present their practice and research in the field of urban heritage, followed by expert reviews and panel discussion. Before presentations, it's my great honor to invite Pietro Alessi, the president of ISOCAP, and Patricia Albert, the president of International Association of World Heritage Professionals, to give welcome words. So Pietro, may I invite you to start? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And really, thank you, Lee. Uh, you said everything already, and but I want to see very few words that I'm very happy to see again a Cyber Agora running on the ISOCAP platform with so many people and focusing on a very important topic how cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is important all over the world in this moment to uh, create economy in neighborhoods, in towns, in cities, in metropolitan areas. It's a driver for development. And we have to make it through our creativity, a driver for a sustainable development. Cultural heritage is material, immaterial. It's a legacy of the past. It's something that we create in the present in something that is connected to us as a human beings, but to the nature too. So even then we can connect very easily now, cultural heritage and nature-based solutions. So uh, we today face a very important topic that will shape the present. Now we, we plan as we talk always about the future of the cities, but let's talk about the present. Let's try to understand how to use cultural heritage in planning the contemporary city. And I would like to thank you, uh, uh, our speakers. Uh, some of them, I know them personally, uh, and uh, others, I will uh, listen to them for the first time uh, today. Uh, that they will now bring us different point of view, but keeping in mind that this is a key pillar of contemporary urban and regional planning. I don't want to steal any more time to, um, it's better we go uh, in, uh, into the content that we um, listen to uh, your presentations and then we can have a live discussion. But thank you, thank you again for uh, organizing this and for being present at this online uh, event. I'm really, I repeat, very, very happy about to see many people here. Thank you very much. Of course, last thing that I forget always, but uh, uh, I took the occasion, but uh, many of you already uh, received the uh, email, the newsletter. I would like to remember that uh, uh, our Congress in, uh, in uh, Toronto, it will be held from our global Congress from uh, 10 to 13 of October. And it is on topic of how to finance the climate transition. That is basically another key important issue uh, of cities uh, today. So of course, as a president of ISOCAR, I'm inviting you to join uh, to Toronto in person and uh, stay with us and uh, celebrate this Global Congress in October 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Lifan. I give you back the floor. Thank you, Pietro, um, for your inspiring words. And we are really hoping to see you again in Toronto. And now I would like to invite Patricia Arbert to give her welcome words. Thank you very much, Lee, and a warm welcome on behalf of the International Association of World Heritage Professionals. I'm very happy to see that uh, so many interested people are joining us today on the Cyber Agora. And I'm happy that this is our premiere, the first collaboration between ISOCARP and the International Association of World Heritage Professionals on a very important topic. Um, our association was found in 2010 as a network of professionals supporting each other, learning together, um, inspiring uh, joint projects and doing research together. Just last week, we had a, a regional meeting in Brussels where we visited the European Parliament 
and had an inspiring talk with Dr. Johanna Leisner, the EU expert on um, cultural heritage and climate change. So in case you're not yet a member of our association, you might want to consider becoming one. And otherwise, I look very much forward to today's presentations, to our discussions, and uh, would like to keep my contribution short to leave even more space to our um, inputs today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, as a member of International Association of World Heritage Professionals myself, I would like to add one sentence. Our association is quite similar to e-commerce, which also for heritage professionals, but we are targeting uh, early to middle career professionals. We are a very young organization. So welcome to join. Um, in this webinar, three sessions, three sessions are organized in the presentation part. Session one is dedicated to voices of practitioners who work at the front line of heritage conservation, dealing with complex daily social and political challenges. In session two, policy advisors and academics will draw our attention to the understated heritage, heritage that most of us still don't know the culture and the social significance of our heritage shaped local identity and build a collective memory. In session three, urban planning professionals will take a broad view on heritage protection and endeavor to explore innovative strategies towards sustainable urban heritage conservation. Uh, in the presentation part, each speaker has eight minutes to talk, unfortunately very short, because we, we, want, we want to have time for panel discussion. Our colleague will remind you shortly before eight minutes. We have a really compact program. So for each session, we may have time for one or two questions. If you have questions, you can type it in the chat or you can raise your hand and speak. We'll give you a sign. In the final discussion part, you will have more chance to ask questions and communicate with our presenters. For now, I would like to welcome the first speaker, Isan Yuha. Isan Yuha is the director of Center for Culture Heritage Preservation in Palestine for 15 years. He was the deputy mayor of Bethlehem from 2012 to 2017. He's also a partner lecturer at the Bethlehem University. He will give some insights from his work on, on world heritage conservation in Bethlehem. So Isan, would you like to start? Thank you, Fanzi, and hello, everyone. I am pleased to be here with you. Thank you for ISOCARP and for the International Association for World Heritage Professionals, which I am a member of, for organizing such an important workshop. Uh, I believe that uh, this is also a good option, uh, uh, a good uh, uh, event for me in order to share with you some of our work at. Bethlehem in Palestine. I would like to share with you the screen. Let me, ah, okay. So uh, I am the director for the Center for Cultural Heritage Preservation, a center that work in Bethlehem area in Palestine to uh, uh, preserve the cultural heritage, build up cultural heritage and raise the awareness for need of its uh, preservation. Uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, share with you our experience in revitalizing the Star Street. The Star Street is the site with, uh, known as Pilgrimage Route, and it was inscribed with the Church of Nativity on the World Heritage List in year 2012. At that time, when it was shared, it was shared on World Heritage List in, in danger. And that means that there was no management plan by that time. So we have worked to prepare an, a management plan which was endorsed by the World Heritage Committee in year 2018. But also we have worked in parallel to do other works. Uh, the work, uh, the uh, Star Street is important uh, because it's linked with traditional practices and festivals related to the birth, birth event of Jesus Christ in this in Bethlehem. 
It derives for its name from the Christmas procession during the patriarch visit to Bethlehem. Uh, and there are lots of uh, important heritage sites in, the, in that street. Uh, I cannot. This is a map of the street that shows the street that starts with the roundabout of Star Street and at, ends at the Church of Nativity. Uh, in the street, there are several. Oh, sorry. There are several uh, important sites, such as small museums, churches, uh, religious sites, uh, uh, public squares, and so on. In the year 2012, when this street had been inscribed on, was inscribed on the World Heritage List, the, street, uh, the site had been facing some challenges, like poor tourist services, inadequate infrastructure, poor and sporadic community activities, inadequate and insufficient signage and information panels for tourists. We, uh, there have been rare visits conducting to the site, even by locals or by international visitors. Uh, there have been no parking lots. There have been several abandoned buildings, which shall become a news. Uh, few enterprises exist in the street. Most of the shops were closed and no management plan. So the Center of Cultural Heritage Preservation have launched an action plan. This action plan was in the participation with the participation of the municipality of Bethlehem, the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the Chamber of Commerce, and the local, communi uh, the local community. The action plan targeted four main fields, the urban rehabilitation infrastructure, rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of traditional buildings, improve services within the street and conduct promotional activities. Those, uh, this plan have been launched in parallel of the need of having a conservation and management plan, which was, uh, we have worked in parallel with the uh, Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities and the Municipality of Bethlehem. For the urban rehabilitation project, we have focused on uh, five main projects. The first one was, the, this is the map that shows the Star Street. We did not only uh, roll on the re rehabilitation and upgrading the infrastructure of the Star Street, but also in the surrounding streets leading to the Star Street and that can improve the accessibility to the street. This is some of the photos that shows our in intervention in the Star Street. This photo shows before and after. We have upgraded the electrical and mechanical uh, networks. We have cleaned the facade. We have painted the shops. We have uh, turned it more into pedestrian street with limited accessibility for vehicles. We have improved safety for people. These also some photos before and after that shows also we have provided some street furniture like uh, benches, uh, 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 garden, uh, uh, flower beds. Also these photos show, we have also um, decided to split the space between restricted roads that can only be more used by vehicles and some more safe roads that can be used by pedestrians. Of course, the vehicles were only permitted to use the street in certain hours. These are some roads that lead to Star Street. Also, it was rehabilitated, Wardia Street, Handel Stairway, some photos that shows our intervention and this, 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 these stairways before and after. Also, we have improved the accessibility to the roundabout, which is the beginning of the Star Street. Here we have rotated some uh, roads that can ensure that bus can go to roundabout, drop off tourists and exit without continuing in the same street. These are some photos that shows our intervention in the branches of the Star Street. 
The second field of intervention was about using the abandoned buildings and for, uh, and for current use that can provide added value of the streets in terms of culture and tourist uses. This was the first building. This building was abandoned, not in use. We have restored the building and used it. And now we have established Dar Sabba, a research center for Palestinian living in diaspora. It encouraged those Palestinians who are living in diaspora to come to find their roots and know more about their heritage. And also it encouraged them to visit the Star Street. These are some photos that show this building before and after. Now, uh, the Sabbath have become very important site for all people coming from diaspora to visit the Star Street. The second building was Hos Abu Hosh Abu Jarur. This building was restored to be used as an icon school. It's a handicraft, traditional handicraft that have been uh, spread in Palestine from Bethlehem. We have on, not only managed to uh, provide an attraction at the street, but also to, revi to revive an important handicraft that used to be in, to spread to whole Palestine from Bethlehem. These also are some photos on the left that shows how the building used to be and how we come after restoration. Also, we have restored a third building, which is the uh, Hosh Hananiya. The building has been almost collapsed. We have restored it, and it has been used by the organization called Holy Land Trust, who are working on conducting activities at the street, such as festivals, markets, and so on. Our fourth project for rehabilitation of building was Hosh Tarian to be used and for, uh, to be restored for adaptive use of guest house. It was one of the pioneer examples of using the historic building as a guest house. This is also photo that shows photo, uh, the, build, the site before and after. It's now used as a guest house with a capacity of uh, 30 person. And this project have also encouraged private sector to uh, have similar project. Improved services, we have also worked in, on imp improving parking lots, improved street lighting, uh, provide uh, sanitary facilities for tourists. And uh, uh, the, our fourth intervention was in promotional activities how to engage private sector participati participation in revitalizing, revitalizing the street, print brochures, create developed tourist facilities, uh, pre uh, prepare plan of calendar of activities, improve information and signage, raise awareness of local community, provide, produce promotional videos for the street, enhance craftsman workshop tradition, and traditional food shops at the street, and develop a management and conservation plan. These are, are some photos for the activities that have been launched. Here are some photos shows the participation of local community in, or in planning for activities within the street. We have launched, uh, we have been able to in, uh, install uh, in, information panels and to print books about the guides about Bethlehem and the street. Also, we have print uh, maps that can be distributed to visitors to know better about the sites in the place. Also, we have been able to organize some activities uh, such as uh, showing film, playing films within the street. Uh, summer festival have been organized in the street with the, with the participant of lots of local and uh, international uh, visitors, where also handicraft have been able to uh, produce and sell their products. Uh, Christmas market also have been organized in the street. Uh, thematic tours have been also organized for a lot of local and tourist groups to raise the awareness about this important street. Also, we have um, uh, addressed these thematic tours for young generation. And this is our experience in revitalizing the street. Until now, we, the process is still ongoing. We have 
managed to, uh, to reach uh, to a significant uh, achievement, but I think this is a process, continuous process that needs to uh, maintain the momentum until we reach to a point where this street is being very active and um, an important attract attraction for more than 3 million visitors who come to the Church of Nativity. Thank you. Thank you, Isan, for giving us insights in heritage conservation in Bethlehem, Palestine, which is a relatively less presented region in international discourse in heritage conservation. So we have a really um, good chance to hear from you today what's going on in Palestine. Thank you. So. Could you stop screen sharing, please? Ah, yes, okay. Stop sharing. From Palestine, we move to another UNESCO World Heritage City, Bamberg in Germany. Diana Butler is the acting head of World Heritage Office in World Heritage City of Bamberg. She will tell a story on how to manage horticulture as urban heritage in her work with the World Heritage Office in Bamberg. So please, uh, Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, very well. Okay. Yes. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about horticulture as urban heritage in the world heritage city of Bamberg. Um, Bamberg is located in the south of Germany, in the state of Bavaria. And with over 77,000 inhabitants, Bamberg is a growing mid-sized town and an urban district. The town of Bamberg has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1993. Bamberg has one of Europe's largest intact whole town centers with over a thousand single monuments from a whole millennium. The town is a perfect example of an idyllic city whose roots stem from the Middle Ages. The World Heritage Sites consists of three historical settlements, the city on the hills, characterized by imposing architecture, the island district, a vibrant heart of trade and commerce, and the Market Gardeners District with this long tradition of market gardening that still lives on today. The Market Gardeners District will be the center of attention right now. Urban market gardening has been carried out in Bamberg since the Middle Ages. Europe-wide trade in seeds and licorice root once formed a significant part of the local economy. Until today, these unique large size fields, which you can see here, here on these pictures, have been preserved. However, with the passing of time, globalization and mass production, the traditions on which them um, and with them, the historic use of the fields threatens to disappear. Some locals would like to use the fields as building sites, others simply stop cultivating the grounds. Now we will have an inside look on our project urban gardening. From former 500 gardeners, only 40 gardener families live and work on their own farms in Bamberg today. Because the sector has shrunk, however, much gardening land in the inner city area has fallen out of use. Space for which sensitive use must now be found. The project Urban Gardening is intended to keep alive the typical Bamberg gardener's culture, to develop new methods of gardening, and to preserve the unique and outstanding inner city gardening lands as part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It combines topics of urban planning, monument protection, community involvement, tourism, and commercial horticulture in a special way. The pro project splits into three different topics, marketing, e e education and tourism, and land use, which I will explain in the following. One goal of the marketing part is to strengthen the gardening family businesses in Bamberg economically and to promote old local varieties. 
in order to preserve the tradition and promote their products more efficiently, 19 Bamberg Garden families have joined forces to form the Bamberg Gardeners Association. We created a common brand to promote the high quality products of the Bamberg Gardeners Association. And for more visibility, um, we, in, we have um, produced information for the public about the gardeners and the unique district. Um, you can see the shopping guide here on this slide with descriptions, addresses, and opening times for the gardening businesses, but also with additional information on the district. Since 2012, we yearly organize an open day where the Gardeners Association provides special looks behind the scenes. This day is a unique event, attracts people from near and far. Part two is education and tourism. The jewel in the crown of the Market Gardeners District and unique in Germany is the new design Gardeners and Winters Museum, a unique collection in a typical Bamberg Gardeners house. The museum illustrates the commercial lives and of the urban market gardeners and wine growers, which we here in Bamberg call Hecker, um, and shows their culture and their history. After 30 years, we were able to redesign the whole museum, not just the exhibition inside, um, but also the garden in the in the, the garden area in the back. The gardeners are still the owner of the exhibition and managing the museum, but today under better and more professional circumstances. Besides the museum, we installed a walking route through the gardeners district that offers insights into the gardeners' cultural, religion, and economic lives. We integrated the next door market gardens into the route and installed a viewing platform so visitors can view over the garden land right into in the, in the middle of the old town. Part three, land use. For several centuries, Bamberg was one of the most significant liquidity produ producing re region. The urban gardening project has reawakened interest in the plant and encouraged its cultivation once again. Licorice is now not just a souvenir, but also trending to be used in tea, beer, and sausages. We also set up a heritage garden, which conserves and presents Bamberg's heritage vegetable variety, including potatoes, radish, cabbage, and onion, a contribution to biodiversity, as well as to historical and environmental education. What opportunities does this present for Bamberg? World heritage sites usually attract a high amount of visitors and tourists. As you can imagine, Bamberg is a rather small city with narrow streets. So if you have large groups of tourists at specific places, this can lead to a few disturbances. Therefore, one of the main priorities is to guide the tourists away from the prominent attractions towards less, less, and less known areas like the Market Gardeners District, where there is equally much to explore. In 2019, we were able to open our World Heritage Visitor Center. This new building is the first place in Bamberg to convey its outstanding universal value, and it serves as a reading aid for the World Heritage Site. The permanent exhibition is based on, on the three settlement centers that were connected when the city was founded in the Middle Ages. Other chances we took to provide the special team theme Market Gardeners District are an exhibition and a successful fashion show of apron collection on the Gardnerei in cooperation with an initiative to ha that helps women with migration background. We created an own mascot called Zwiebert to guide children through the dist district. As I mentioned before, licorice is now a wanted souvenir. And we also informed the public about our work to raise awareness for the gardening issue. Um, with a brief look at our next tasks, I will close my presentation. So world heritage education is very important in order to raise awareness for the, for the needs of our world heritage site. Therefore, we want to focus even more on young children so they can take care of their heritage in the future. But we are also working on installing a, re a real district center as well as on uh, updating the museum start. In 2016, mark, urban, marketing, urban, urban market gardening in Bamberg was included in the register of intangible heritage of the Federal Republic of Germany. So the next step, of course, will be the, in the national list. The model project urban gardening impressively demonstrates a variety of poss possibilities for dealing with the material and the intangible heritage of the, of, of the Bamberg's gardener's town. 
an example that preserving has nothing to do with standstill, but like in this case may lead to a further development through customized solutions. Thank you very much. It's a part of integrated the part of heritage. Culture and nature heritage they are not separated from the very beginning. So from these two presentations, are there any immediate questions? So Tianren, could you tell us, is there a question from the chat room or is there, is there anyone who raised their hand? Yeah, I think there's a quick question from our chat box. Uh, it's from Wendy. Uh, actually, it's a, a question about the intangible heritage. So basically, it's all about like the culture or the non spatial related kind of the cultural heritage. And in that case, uh, how do you mainstream that in urban planning, since urban planning is more or less to do with the spatial interventions, right? So how to actually understand the relationship between the spatial and non-spatial aspects? And I think that's a question from Wendy to our two speakers. Who would like to answer? If you don't yeah, mind, I would please. like to... Oh, I'm sorry. Please. please. No, go first, go first. I'll go I, second. I, I didn't get the question. Okay, lady first. So, Diana, please. No, he didn't get the question. Maybe you, you can repeat it for him. Yeah, it's a question about the intangible heritage. So, basically, like tangible versus intangible, right? And how do you mainstream that? Actually, how do we actually advocate that or under actually take that into account into our spatial planning? And that's the question, yeah. Yeah, so in, in the case of Bamberg, it is uh, not that difficult because um, both parts um, have um, yeah, very much in common. So not only the gardener's district um, is part of the world heritage, so the architectural structure, but also the, the cultural and religious aspect of the gardeners are part of the intangible heritage. So here, both um, UNESCO programs go hand in hand and overlap in, in, in some cases. Um, I think it's more uh, difficult if you have um, the intang intangible heritage in an area where, so if you have a, um, an association practicing a special, a special dance, um, but this is not connected to, to an architectural site, um, this is more difficult because um, because both of the of um, both both topics won't um, connect to each other, but not or not relate on each other. So um, um yeah, it's 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 um, more practical if you have a connection to the architecture surrounding you. For for Bethlehem, uh, this site of the Star Street have been nominated on the world uh, inscribed on the world heritage list for two criteria, criteria four and criteria six of the cultural heritage, criteria six, which concern about the intangible heritage of the site and its association with the event of the birth of the Je Jesus Christ and the traditions. So it was very important that the site should also not only being preserved as a built-up heritage, but also to maintain and preserve the tradition and customs and beliefs that used to take place in that street. So during our work, we have not only focused on restoring the building and, uh, and uh, improving the aesthetic value of these buildings, but also we have worked on uh, revitalizing the old handicraft, traditional handicraft that used to take place in that street, and revitalizing the religious and cultural activities that used to take place in that street. Maybe I can, can add one thing. So for the intangible heritage, it's the most important thing to raise awareness and to keep the, 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 um, the activity um, so whatever this is in, in, in the case alive and to keep um, the, the, the group of people who cultivate or who, who do this activity um, yeah, active and um, fit for the future. Thank you, Wendy, for the question and thank you for answering. 
I think we have to move to the session two. And in panel discussion part, you have more chance to ask and answer questions. So now I hand over to Tianren for session two and session three. Thank you, Lee, actually, for hosting our session one, uh, where actually we have our global and local leaders and practitioners sharing with us about their experiences on uh, urban heritage. Uh, for session two, uh, we mainly focus and invite our academics and policymakers and have a focus on our cultural and social significance of our urban heritage uh, in our daily practice. Our uh, first speaker is uh, Martin Kapp. Uh, Martin actually wears a number of hats. He is a researcher, writer, strategist, and a sector development specialist. Uh, he had worked for more than 25 years across all five uh, continents, assisting governments to capitalize on opportunities arising from creative uh, creativity and innovation sectors. He is currently the advisor to Prime Minister for Creative Industries and Tourism uh, in Serbia. Uh, Martin, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you are muted, Martin. I didn't share, practice sharing my screen, so let's make sure that we can do this. There we go. Share and let's go. So right. my background is in this particular instance is quite simple and straightforward. I'm going to talk to you about what we are doing around heritage um, in Serbia, one of the two of the bigger projects that we have. And these fall underneath the uh, Serbia Creates banner that the Prime Minister created to try and uh, develop creativity and innovation um, to promote notions of creativity and innovation, both locally and internationally, and obviously to try and change how Serbia is perceived around the world. Um, the projects, the two things I'm actually want to talk to you about, and I'm talking really um, both from a heritage and cultural perspective, but also from a town and city planning perspective. So what you're seeing on the screen now is a small uh, settlement within the bounds of the city of Belgrade called Vincia. And you can see in the center of the screen, there's a, there's a kind of a hillock. That's a, a tell. It's a um, ge generations, centuries of rubbish piled across on top of each other and compressed. Uh, the rest of the city you see behind it, all of those houses, many of them have been developed at a time when there was no city planning, um, and they're all sitting on an incredibly important uh, historical site. These Many of these properties are actually illegal. Now, back in 1908, uh, Professor Miloj Vasic at the University of Belgrade started excavating this site on a, um, on a hunch. He was, had been given something out that had been found by the river. And initially, they thought that they'd found a site that uh, dated back to around the time of Troy, or they thought it was perhaps a, an Athenian colony. But as the century has progressed, and as carbon dating and leader technology and all of these kinds of things have become available, uh, it's become clear that essentially what we are talking about at uh, Vinci Bellaberto is a 7,000-year-old uh, European, early European culture um, that was thriving in the Western Balkans uh, a good 2,000 years before the pyramids in Egypt. Um, and as that became commonly known as being a thing that uh, was, was sort of historically recognized, people started digging all around the region. And the Vinci culture was seen to spread right across the Balkans into all of the countries across the region. To be quite clear, following the rivers, in many, many instances. Now, the reason why um, I'm here to talk to you at all is that one of the, um, the main implications of this venture culture is that it's the first time in, certainly in European history that's been found that humans gathered together in large settlements. It was the, essentially the first city. And to give you an idea of that kind of importance for only 5% of human history has taken place in cities. Um, and this is really the first time that people gather together. Um, Vincher itself had a population uh, of about 4,000 people. And what, to give you an idea of how crazy this is in terms of concept, 
the venture settlement I showed you before has a population of about 3.6 people per square kilometer. Um, in 5,300 BC, this settlement had a population of 200 people per square kilometer. Uh, so really did massively change. And okay, a couple of, I get so excited about this and I know I don't have much time. So what we saw, what we see in Vinchar is formalized town planning for the very first time in, in the historic record as we see it at the moment. So um, the properties were, uh, were, were constructed facing northeast to southwest. There was often just a meter between them. They were constructed primarily from wood and clay, but also with leveled foundations, um, decorated as the century, centuries proceeded. Uh, we saw things like hearths built in and um, double story constructions and separate factories set aside for building cultural and creative objects. And because Vincha set it was in place for 1,200 years, we can also in the historical record see how the culture was passed from, as we say in Serbia, from knee to knee, so from, from parents to children. We see children being taught to work creative pod product. It's actually, you know, it's amazing. And some of these settlements went up. There's one called D Devostin, which um, has 1,028 houses and up to 8,200 people. We're talking, you know, 5,000 BC for these kind of things. And to give you um, some overviews of some of these other, this is not the Bella Burdo site. This is one of the other ones that was discovered. Um, you can see how densely packed these properties were. Um, and, you know, they are, they're I said, divided by ditches, there are fences, there are public, um, public squares. Um, and really what you're seeing is the, you know, the, the very first examples of civic town planning in, uh, that we have in the European record. Um, there are a number of things that came about. I mean, imagine that society has never gathered in this way before. Um, and suddenly you have thousands of people gathered in space for generations, for 1,200 years, sharing knowledge and experience. And so what we see from Vincha is a massive explosion of um, all sorts of the kind of things that we actually take for granted today. So the first was the smelting of copper, um, you know, from natural ingredients, but also from trade gathered from right around the region. Uh, the first copper smelting was discovered in Vincha. Um, we also had massive advancements in, in um, in artistry, ceramics exploded in Venture, but we also see things like, um, amazingly, they wore short skirts and v-necked dresses, and we can see these things from um, the obviously those have all long rotted, but we see their imprints in the in the clay that was being used. The other thing I find fascinating about this Venture project um, is that what it also required from this sort of spatial planning of, of thousands of people crammed into one place for the first time was new ways of living together. So although there are record of uh, historic defenses and things like this, there are no records of, of, a, um, of a, a hierarchy, there are no kings, there are no um, kind of high status, low status, everyone is treated the same. And there's no record of conflict in the in the community for for 1,200 years, which it may well still be found, obviously. But right now, it indicates that this kind of planning, this kind of thought, this kind of society, as it's developing the various early stages of human history, has found new ways to live together, which is kind of amazing. One of the other things that um, we still haven't found in the historic record to be able to prove it definitively, but we have these things called Vincha symbols, which 5,000 examples of them. Um, we don't call it writing yet. It's not, it's not what we're talking about, but it's clear that it was used for marking something. And scientists have attempted to identify the very first written sentence in all humankind, uh, which was actually the bear goddess and the bird goddess are the same mind-blowing what this means for me really though is you know this is perhaps the goddess artemis that has been you know two thousand years before it's ever even thought about in greece so we at the serbian government have taken this um site very seriously to be honest until 2017 it had largely fallen into disrespect disrepair and 
Uh, this was the state of the of the tell that you know we saw the the excavation of in 1908. But what the plan from now on is is to develop it into a a, a covered dig so that the um, digging can carry on throughout the year. Um, a permanent visitor center and exhibition center and a science center to be able to continue the work. We've also used Vincia specifically at the United, uh, at the World Expo in Dubai um, because it told all sorts of new stories about the way that modern Serbia is thinking about its heritage. And um, so, yes, that, that. but yeah, very quickly, I also, as I- Sorry, Mati, one more minute. One more minute. So there's also Lipinski Vir, which is a, an even older settlement in South Serbia, um, 10,000 years old, formal planning of the town, um, including laid out marketplaces. Every every um, house in the village faces the river. Um, massive opportunity. We've done all sorts of things in terms of this is one of the original settle settlers, 10,000 years old, which we've turned into a um, with our gaming industry to try and combine the two. Come and experience Serbia and come and see the, the home, the, the, the birthplace of city planning. Um, for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, for a very fascinating actually sharing about uh, the interesting stories behind Nisha. Thank you. And uh, yeah, in the interest of time, we will move on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Elena Batunova. Uh, she is a senior researcher uh, at RWTH, uh, Aachen University in Germany. Uh, she holds a PhD in urban planning, design, and policy from the Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy. And her research interests include uh, urban heritage preservation and use urban shrinkage, small and medium-sized cities, and urban planning. Uh, uh, Martin, would you mind stop sharing so that our next and speaker- how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I skip move on to the top of your screen. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. We I have... think we made it. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. Yeah, thank you, Elena. And uh, uh, her actually, her topic is quite interesting because she is actually combining two very topical issues: shrinking from yeah. Okay. All right. Over thank to you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, yes, I've been uh, studying for a long time shrinking cities, and actually, I love this topic because. It challenged our understanding of many urban processes. It challenged our approaches to uh, urban planning and policy making for in urban areas. And this is very important topic for heritage preservation. I I think because heritage preservation is uh, itself is a product of urban growth because it it's appeared as a concept on the the ground of risk of losses that urbanization, fast urbanization provoke. So the fear of modernity uh, forced us to <clears throat> preserve what we want to preserve. And it's heritage, the heritage concept itself, it functions very well and very well integrated in growth paradigm itself because we try to accumulate more, we try to widen our understanding of heritage, including more and more tangible and intangible object that we would like to preserve. But at the same time, we can't ignore anymore, anymore this new parallel reality of shrinking cities, which is globally spread. And actually most of countries in the world are affected by this um, uh, phenomenon. And of course, there are very famous examples, Detroit or Leipzig or something like this, but uh, behind every, uh, there are thousands of shrinking cities in the world and behind every this city, there is a complex causes and consequences that are, um, have been, the scholars have been trying to conceptualize to create the universal concept and models of shrinking cities, but every time we understand that this is very much dependent on the local context where the national, global, regional. The same we can say about the consequences of shrinking cities. Yes, we know that the most important, and not important, but the most used indicator is demographic change, so demographic decline. And we used to compare shrinking cities uh, using this uh, indicator, but there are many other consequences, social, economic, uh, and also spatial transformation. And when we come to the spatial transformation, this is the main point when the consequences of urban shrinkage became visible in urban uh, physical urban scape. That is where the policymakers start to worry about urban shrinkage and start to develop and apply different policies. 
These policies can be loudly pronounced, such as a famous citywide master plan of Youngstone, because it was the first master plan accepting urban shrinkage. But still, uh, in many places, this uh, issue is quite uh, taboo, it ignored, because it's not comfortable to speak about urban shrinkage. But still, policymakers try to apply different uh, measures in order to make a city more resilient from relocation of people to demolition of um, existing urban structure and reshaping infrastructure. And here, what is important for the heritage preservation, because uh, when we come to the strategies and we have to decide what to preserve, what to demolish, uh, with the issue of heritage, it becomes very important. And then what is notable in all these policies, in most of these policies, uh, even in some extreme, uh, such as Polanka in Finland, which promotes the pessimism and uh, promotes itself as the worst, best worst uh, town in the world. Anyway, most of these policies, they are again growth oriented. They try to promote tourism, they try to diversify economy. So it's a little bit uh, functioning again in the growth paradigm. And uh, now when we look to the literature about the heritage in shrinking cities, which is quite small because it's a topic which is just recently started to be discussed, we can observe two main issues discussed in the academic literature. The first issue is linked to how to preserve the heritage when we have reduced budget, uh, we have decline in economic activity, activities, decline in money. But to be honest, this issue is not that different from uh, the questions or, uh, which growing cities uh, ask for their heritage preservation. And the second issue is how to use the existing heritage in order to diversify economy, in order to promote touristic activities, touristic economy. So there are two main topics. Another very small amount of literature is uh, talking about the positive impact of urban shrinkage at the, its initial stage, because uh, when the developers' interests are reduced, when uh, investments are reduced, commercial activities are reduced, of course, for the existence uh, of heritage is quite a positive thing at the beginning. And this is important. But I would like to set some questions that I think are important for the future agenda setting in terms of uh, understanding how should we consider heritage in uh, shrinking cities. And the first question will be whose heritage? Yes, we are talking about quantitatively declining communities, but there is a huge a qualitative change of the local community. First, very often, it's not the rule, but very often the um, population decline is linked to the aging. And if we consider the heritage as the social cultural processes, which help us to transform the past knowledges, past cultural values to the future generations, in terms of engineering, which kind of future gen generations should be considered? Who are those? And how many of these future consumers of our heritage values? Uh, the second uh, qualitative, uh, sorry, it doesn't work. I don't know. Uh -huh. The second uh, qualitative change is linked with the policies that shrinking cities apply. Very often they try to attract new inhabitants and in implementing different demographic programs, migration programs. And this means that newcomers of the city, first, they do not have attachment to the local heritage, but they bring with themselves the new heritage, which is important for them. So that means that in shrinking cities, the reshaping of relationship between community and uh, <clears throat> the herit physical uh, heritage is constantly reshaping. Uh, and sometimes, uh, uh, like in this case of Subotic Saint Serbia, when the building itself remained synagogue, but uh, the community disappeared. So what should we preserve in this case? Uh, the building which doesn't have the previous meaning it, it, as it had for the uh, Jewish community. The second question that I would like to ask is that when we consider the heritage as a political process, and we know that in most cases uh, in heritage making, the main actor is the state and, and in heritage preservation itself, uh, those uh, signs of abandonment, vacation, degradation, they are not just signs of economic decline of the, of the places, but also the signs of uh, re reducing mean, mean, meaning meaning of these places for the state as the main actor. So the state uh, started to uh, de decline its presence in uh, also in heritage preservation in these places. 
And again, when we talk about the um, state as the main heritage maker, we know perfectly that he, uh, the state tries to focus on the glorious heritage, on victory heritage, on heroism, on trying to hide uncomfortable past of the state and the cities. And the, in the case of shrinking cities, uh, those cities became uncomfortable present for the, uh, for the state. And in many places, like in this case of Vorkutai, one Russian city uh, found it as a gulag camp, those uncomfortable uh, present and uncomfortable past, they coexist together, making the heritage preservation, preservation even more uh, challenging. The other issue is um, how should we consider this existing heritage as a resource or a burden? And this question is not very easy, absolutely not easy to answer because Focusing for, for more than a century on urban growth, we actually not know many uh, much about shrinking cities. So it means that uncertainty, uncertainty in shrinking cities are much higher and it's much more difficult to predict and to make a decision. And when we again try to think about the physical urban structure and the decision between preservation and demolition, which both actions require uh, investments and efforts and uh, everything, uh, from the extreme poles, like the examples of Leipzig, where they decided to preserve the existing uh, residential heritage and which becomes after when the city uh, came back to, to grow, it becomes a very important um, resource for the future development. And to the demolition program in many, many uh, cities in the world, which try to maintain the existence, uh, the existing uh, resilience of real estate market and the existing resilience of urban structure. In all these um, processes, what is important because uh, is important the Western approach to heritage with its much focus on materiality and authenticity, but uh, especially when we consider the residential heritage to be resistant, to be uh, to exist, it should function, it, uh, it should preserve its function. It means it should adapt itself to the new consequences of urban shrinkage, especially demographic change. And my uh, point here is that urban shrinkage itself produced the new heritage, the heritage of the period of shrinkage. And just to emphasize the importance of this point, I just want to finish with this most valued shrinking city in the world, which lasts for uh, many centuries and which lost uh, almost seven, more than 70% of its population from the original one, but we can't deny that this heritage is highly precise for the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Elena, for your actually sharing on the urban heritage in the context of shrinking cities, the shrinking era, which is quite important and uh, timely. Thank you. And uh, um, uh, without further ado, I will move on to invite our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Tan Gang Yi uh, from China. And uh, Professor Tan is the professor and associate dean at the Huazhong University of Science and Technology. Uh, she, he is the Secretary General of the Chinese Committee of Vernacular uh, Architecture. He won the 2003 UNESCO Asia Pacific Heritage Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation and also the first prize of rural architecture design from Architecture Society of China. Uh, Professor Ken, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, so I'm sorry. So, uh, I share the research on the build heritage of the third movement uh, city cities in China as a modern heritage. From 1964 to 1987, large-scale construction of the national defense, industrial and the transport infrastructures, many in 13 provinces and the regions of the central and the western China, shows as the blue arrow. They were carried out with the war preparations as a guiding ideology, known as the third front movement or the third front construction. Without this movement, there would uh, have been no industrial new cities such as Shiyan, Panzhua, and uh, uh, Liu Panshui. It took uh, about uh, 16 years to build more than uh, 1,100 large and medium-sized industrial and mining uh, mining enterprise, 
scientific uh, institution and uh, to build a second complete defense and uh, heaven industrial system. About four million people went to the third front from all over China. The third front uh, construction greatly raised the level of productivity in the central and the western China, with a large number of industrial workshops, equipment, and the production lines remaining. They are on the subject of the heritage and the service as an important uh, uh, testimony to the local and the national industrial history. This industrial heritage has a, an able attribute in themselves. Uh, furthermore, large scale production and the construction infrastructures at a regional or level uh, or national level, such as the railway transport infrastructures, have linked the uh, uh, corresponding industrial canines, uh, chains and uh, town clusters. They were uh, super engineers. They, they formed the potential heritage of a railway cultural road heritage. So we research beyond the upper level and the building level based on the type of type of knowledge and the, at some issues in regional level. The social and the spatial relation corresponds exactly to the hierarchy analysis of a GMP pre proposed by the philosopher Lefebvre. They are whole mean global, the middle or midst, the individual or private. Uh, Shiyan is a good example located in the northwestern Hubei province. This is known as the city of motors because of the home ground second motor factory, uh, the later Dongfeng Motor Company. Uh, Shiyan was the original uh, real a rural area until 1966. It was selected as the site of a second motor factory. The site choice must follow some principles. Leo mountains, far away town, dispersed, hiding in a cave. The old street and the rural settlements were always built spontaneous over a long period of time in response to their environment. With the uh, construction, the revenge has uh, revolved to, from those low street and long street to a uh, halfway street and then to the central street. The landscape has both urban and the rural characteristics, while the power of the state uh, intervene, the factories become the new socialist uh, worker unit. Three in Chinese means uh, uh, 10 revenge or 10 small volumes. The building ever of the second motor factory spread over seven revenues, thus making it look like a certain town. It developed development quickly, and then the basic fabric of the city was formed after the third front movement. In order to prepare for war, and at the same time to produce scientifically, 27 specialized factories uh, were divided into four series and built in four zones according to their process line and then the terrain. Cost of thinking, there are two kinds of special organization of the city. The power city created with a clear purpose, and the second, the random city or the typographic city. I think in the front, uh, in the third front movement cities is in a third mode, which is combined these two together. Uh, in the beginning, a small community is formed to uh, uh, formed on construction sites, consisted uh, consisting of an scout uh, workers, managers, etc. They were working, learning, and living together. They formed a military team organization to participate in the construction, including the family members. These women respond for not only housework, but also get involved in the construction. And Peter Neverson also uh, emphasized that uh, industrial archaeology is most typically characterized by the uh, lead to construct a, a complete history of uh, uh, the industrial activities of human uh, society, 
with the participation of the professional and the uh, mutuals from different backgrounds. The living district of these factories is almost a history of residence architecture, including uh, tent, mat shed, Raymond S. House, single uh, dormitories and uh, family buildings. And it is the object of study on the private uh, habitat level by Lefebvre. The change of the living forms reflect the transformation of uh, the individual and the collect collective. The collective dormitory was regarded as a valuable experience. Uh, it is a school that teaches how to get along with the people, how to do better with oneself and how to cultivate uh, comradeship. The auditorium or uh, club is one of the most uh, typical types of uh, architecture in the period. They have uh, ver uh, various uh, uh, shapes with the modernist uh, uh, shape or the uh, ethnic forms or and uh, so-called Soviet style. Most of them were designed and uh, built in highest level and uh, gave a, a defining function through the collective activities. So they are often named such as people's stage, masses uh, theater. Uh, Gan Dale itself is a traditional construction skill. It is uh, mainly used for low star residents it has become a response to the shortage of materials, then combine a new construction system and become more popular through mass movement. Finally, it's rising to be a kind of spirit because of its reflect the ideology of the times of the union of workers and the farmers and then the design revolution. The construction company name from Soviet uh, construction uh, techniques and keep their building codes. On the other hand, they, the builders self reliance and uh, invented uh, many adaptive new technology, such as the uh, assembled process. Uh, above, I have uh, briefly explored uh, five issues of the construction and the governance of uh, Shiye, including in infrastructure, the urban form, construction society on site, enterprise society, and so on. Uh, this kind of organization model of uh, enterprise ring society plan play very important roles in socialist China's urban and the Euro areas in Mao's era. They were could be seen in uh, Japan, USA, and the Soviet Union. According to the World Heritage Paper 5, uh, identification and the document of modern heritage by UNESCO. I think in the third front construction could be a typical modern heritage because it presents a, a significant transformation of uh, human values over a period of time that uh, demonstrate an architecture or technology and town planning or landscape design or a combination of uh, building techniques in an uh, important period in her uh, history. Uh, now, you, this, uh, you have uh, you have one more minute. Yeah, sorry yeah. for chipping. Yeah, yeah, no you. problem. Yeah. No, uh, this man uh, manufacturing uh, block in Xi'an is uh, undergoing uh, brownfield development, and then um, industrial uh, industrial heritage are, uh, are being protected and reused as in the Dongfeng Motor Museum. Uh, Except, uh, except for above renewable design, our team finished some research, including three related uh, research project, uh, projects funded by British and uh, China national, national uh, funding. Uh, more details, please refer to some books and the papers, including plan pers 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 perspectives and the uh, journal of uh, uh, architecture. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Ken. Uh, it's a very interesting, actually, perspective to think from actually both the social and the spatial aspects of those kind of spatial organization, uh, particularly in the Chinese context. Uh, and for the audience, and uh, just a quick note that in the interest of time, uh, we we decided to move our Q and the sessions for the for, for this session and our following session 
uh, to the last part of our today's uh, uh, seminar, to the discussion part, uh, because we are now running behind the schedule. And in the meantime, do please uh, feel free to drop your questions into our chat box, and we will collect your questions and also ask uh, the questions on your behalf to our uh, speakers today. All right, uh, so we will directly move on to our uh, session three, and thank you uh, to all the three uh, speakers in our session two. Uh, the session three, uh, since now we have covered the aspects or the perspectives from our leaders, policymakers, and academics, our session three will actually uh, tackle those kind of urban heritage, heritage uh, from another perspective, the urban planning professionals perspective. And they will share with us about their insights into the innovative strategies towards urban heritage conservation. Uh, we will have two speakers for this session. Our first speaker is Honorata uh, uh, Grazizkoska. Uh, sorry for my <laughs> poor pronunciation. And uh, Honorata, Honorata is actually the founder of uh, Urbanitarian, uh, which is the largest online database of urban scale projects. Her specific expertise and area of interest include self-sufficient urban scale metabolism, uh, master planning, urban design, spatial equity, human scale TOD areas, and healthy uh, communities. Uh, Honorata, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Sharing my screen. Okay, today I'm here to share with you our platform, which is called Urbanitarian. Uh, my name is Honorata Grzesikowska. I am urban designer with an architectural background. Uh, I have my own practice, but I am also a lecturer at Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, mainly in the Master of Advanced Ecological Buildings and Biocities. We are located over here. Uh, we are on top of the Coiserola Park next to Barcelona. Uh, it's uh, old Masia. Uh, it's an old farmhouse uh, with 140 hectares. The students uh, live here for 12 years. They do an immersive master uh, where they um, learn about uh, how to grow your own food, how to design uh, bio buildings, and how to design bio cities. So I'm based here in Barcelona, and for me what is the most interesting about the fact is that the city is where the science of urbanization was born. So for, of course this is the city of Ildefonso Cerda, uh, who designed this expansion of Barcelona. Uh, he was a crazy guy, you know, you have to imagine that he lived in this old town and what he did in order to know how to design the expansion of the city, he actually measured everything. So he lived in the old town where there was no sewage, uh, a lot of diseases, no fresh air, and what he did, he measured everything. So uh, the size of the streets, the amount of inhabitants, uh, how many people live in one apartment, uh, what are the professions in the cities, all these measures. So he did uh, the big data manually. Uh, all, this, uh, all these measures and all the conclusions he wrapped up in this theory, you know, general theory of urbanization. Uh, also, of course, he designed the streets, the crossings. Also, he was thinking about well-being a word that didn't exist at the time, but by designing the spaces for socializing and parks, he also tried to um, find a way how to design the cities so that they are for the people. At IAC, we translated this his theory uh, to English a few years ago, and we were able to go to Harvard to present the book, and I really recommend writing uh, reading it. Um, also, uh, what we did is we took all the data and we did it in this digital form where you can see it uh, also changing the view into the 3D point view. So this Serda was a huge inspiration for me when I uh, founded Urbanitarian. Uh, Urbanitarian is the world's, uh, world's largest urban design reference library. So um, more than 500 examples of urban scale projects. Um, the name Urbanitarian, which is Quite funny, I want to just say, say to you that uh, this name was used by George Osborne, the urban planner of garden cities, and he called people living in, in high densities 
uh, no, uh, he called them pejoratively urbanitarians. So we are all ur urbanitarians now. So this is this uh, database of urban scale projects. We uh, found a need of something like that. When, uh, when you are an architect, there is a lot of resources online where you can find some references for architecture, so for one building. For urban planners, it's very difficult to find examples, especially if you want to know some data, so how big the area is, the project is, how many inhabitants it has, how many square meters. This is how it was born. Um, also, because we were fed up with this kind of articles like the evolution of urban planning in 10 diagrams, it's impossible to show the evolution in 10 diagrams, and they are usually the same diagrams always. So it's not only about the garden cities or the most known urban planners and architects. There are a lot of settlements like the one that today um, uh, we just saw in the previous presentations uh, that were, are were, were worth knowing and worth mentioning. So this is what we do. We just find examples that are not known, but many times, for example, um, some sites that were designed by women uh, that were child friendly, uh, for example, this one, which is the largest uh, neighborhood built in wood. And now they are new uh, neighborhoods that they uh, promote themselves as the, as the largest neighborhood built in wood. But actually we have here one that not so many are aware of. And we go everywhere around the world, especially in the countries that not so much information yet is put in the internet or research so that we can see and learn from the ways of living uh, of people over there and the ways of creating communities. All this data we have gathered in Excel sheets and each project is explained in three ways. One through master plans, so through, through the plan of the area. Another type of the way you can see the project is through the streetscapes and for, through reading an article about it. I would like to show you now the prototype because we have a newer, new version coming in two weeks. So this is how it looks like. It's a, basically a search uh, of this database where you can either search by master plans, streetscapes, or, or, or urbanscapes with the tags. Um, you can choose the text of the site that the team is interesting for you with the scales and also with a status built and built. And one of the status that we have is the urban heritage. For example, if we go to Al Fahidi neighborhood in Dubai, you can see it um, reading uh, some data, available data. You can see the master plan. You can also read some fast description about project and search in the interactive map. You can also look at the streetscapes that are used in this neighborhood, the streetscapes with some description, and you can also uh, read about the neighborhood and see more images about that. We even added a new input to that. We, are, we also think that it's very important if we can see it in 3D. Uh, that's why we, we have built some of the neighborhoods in the metaverse where you can scroll, see around and even you can zoom in to some specific sites to see it uh, well as if you would be over there. We find it very useful for universities, for academies, but also for governments to have a look you know, and to see in a real, let's say real <laughs> fake life, the experience as, as it was built. Uh, I go back to finish my presentation. So what we are trying to achieve is this, this series of content from data, from the data that we gather, we create information from which we have knowledge, and then we create content at, at the end experience whenever it is possible. Um, this, this knowledge production, it's something very interesting. And of course, it's what is our goal, uh, especially that we, we start to have a sense that urbanization, okay, is a science, but without a theory or with thousands of theories. So we are figuring out what is urban design. Urban design is something that is lost between urban planners and architects, so between the scale of millimeters and miles. Also, it's something between bottom up and top down. So this intangible things that were asked today and the tangible stuff that 
the physical aspect of, of designing and also something between physical digital so this uh, virtual world and uh, the actual architecture or design of the streets or design of the blocks um, we one minute yeah <laughs> uh, we are doing it for what to fast for the faster exchange of knowledge we would love to all the stuff that academicians do in the universities that they would be more approachable more visible this knowledge. Also, each of the cities in the world actually has this kind of government governmental map, which is very difficult for other people to you know to understand. We we create shareable material, so very easy for everyone to learn something from this project. We want to promote ourselves. When you look for architectural magazines, you get around one uh, 100 million results. When you look for urban design magazines, it's not even half of it. So we still have to produce a lot of material. We are raising awareness also for inhabitants and we provide this facilitation. So we really want to achieve working together and exchanging the knowledge between developers, government, academy, and, and practitioners. Uh, we would like to invite you also to our uh, meta space, a web space where we can host uh, Events like that, maybe next one could be host over there with some free day overview of some projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorata. It's actually an exciting project. I can see the great potential in urbanitarian, not only in informing our urban designers, but also in actually develop, developing the future generation of urban models, right? Think about if they have enough learning examples to understand what kind of design is good and what's the different experiences users may have, then definitely the, the day of like the AI supported design uh, will, will come. Uh, thank you very much again uh, to our Honorata. And uh, thank you. And uh, uh, we will move on to our last speaker. So last but not least, uh, I will invite uh, uh, Natalia, uh, who is the, an urban planner uh, in urban, uh, urban Sophia. She is an urban and a strategic planner, and she holds a master's degree in urban management for competitive cities. She is also doing a PhD uh, in uh, Bucharest. Her research focuses on cooperation mechanisms to support the post-industrial transition and the revitalization of small mono-industrial cities. Uh, Natalia, uh, I, I, uh, yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the introduction. I will now share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my presentation today will focus on the role of multi-level governance in supporting policies for cultural heritage regeneration of both urban and rural areas, because you will see I will I will start from a more theoretical uh, note and then I will go more into detail in one of our projects, which um, involved creating a cultural route along multiple countries which, can, which connect both uh, urban and rural areas based on cultural heritage revital, revitalization. <clears throat> so let's start for a very simple question. What is multi-level governance? I'm sure uh, there are many different understandings of, of this concept all around the world. It was a continuously evolving concept which was born 30 years ago and which first started as a system of continuous negotiation between governments and different territorial levels with the goal of decentralizing the decisional power. But nowadays, uh, its understanding is much more complex. It is a much more inclusive framework, which aims to assure both vertical and horizontal integration, so between different levels of power, but also between different uh, thematic sectors linked to, to the specific topic with the goal of transferring basically the power and the responsibilities to more stakeholders, which usually don't fit so well in the typical classical government uh, administrative boundaries. And now, sorry. Why is it so essential when dealing with cultural heritage regeneration? We saw also in the previous examples that cultural heritage is a cross-cutting domain, it's a, it, which lays in the intersection of many different fields, and it's influenced by many dynamics in the territory, like society, the economy, 
the uh, urban planning processes, the major projects, tourists and climate changes and so on. But it can also act as a very strong tool for supporting positive dynamics in this regard and supporting social territorial cohesion, creativity, innovation, education, but also climate change mitigation. Also, sorry. It is also very essential because by bringing all of these stakeholders together, it's much easily to harmonize the interest of different stakeholder groups, which have very different views. If you take, for instance, historians, uh, urban planners, the community, the, the private investors, they all have different understandings and it's much easier to bring them together with the decision makers and help the decision makers step outside a traditional approach and jointly identify contemporary meanings for the heritage together with all of these stakeholders and really make it act as a powerful tool for the current uh, challenges, which are of many, many types, societal, environmental challenges, physical challenges, they are, they are very, very diverse. On another note, we saw that is very, we saw also in the previous examples that it's very important to involve communities in finding, um, a role for the cultural heritage and bringing them closer to the heritage in order to strengthen the sense of place. And it's also very important because uh, the cultural heritage assets usually deal with multiple ownership issues which are blocking these integrated approaches for valorization. So it's very important to, to bring them in also on, on the table. Once we have a structure, what next? So from our experience in working in this um, EU-wide uh, transnational cooperation projects or applied research projects, it is very important to have, once you bring everybody together, to have this iterative, a circular process in co-defining issues and values together with the stakeholders. Then based on this, starting defi defining objectives, starting experimenting in the territory, monitoring the effects of your, of your experiments, and then constantly informing the policymakers and pushing authorities to align their priorities with this and with the with the findings and this should be done on a regular basis from time to time because the values are changing based on the effect of the change you produce in the territory so this is very important for this process to be re re started from time to time um, now a bit about the cross-cutting approaches to be considered for effective policies. So on one hand, you have the territorial dimension, so it's very important to include uh, cultural heritage management and conservation approaches and larger territorial frameworks, which this is our job to do as urban planners. Then it's also very important to include cultural heritage and cultural landscapes in wider mobility infrastructure planning. This is something I will show you a bit later uh, in the cultural route uh, project I would present. Also from a socioeconomic and cultural dimension, it's very important, as I said earlier, to, to give it a function in the life of community and to provide inclusive local economic development through cultural heritage. And from an environmental dimension, as we saw also in the previous examples, it's very important to have these circular approaches in cultural heritage management, to have sustainable adaptive reuse of the of the buildings, of the places, of the of even of some materials if needed, and so on, and also to have nature culture approaches and to try to to integrate this environmental, this ecological component in all all projects. Now I will briefly present one of our recent uh, project related to cultural heritage, entitled Easter, connecting historical Danube uh, Roman roots. It was. Um, EU funded project funded through the Interreg Danube Transnational Program, which lasted two years and a half, and which brought together uh, 26 institutions, 16 project partners and 10 associated partners from nine countries along the Danube region, with the goal of creating the premises for a cultural route all, all along these countries, inspired from the Roman uh, heritage. Uh, so the partnership composition was very diverse. We tried to assure a mix of territorial, thematic, and transversal partners. The territorial partners were uh, mostly municipalities, which were the enablers in the territory, which allowed us to, to do the change, to communicate with the other groups, and to actually implement something on, on in their cities or in their rural areas. Then we had the thematic partners, the knowledge providers, which were the uh, universities, the, the museums, the historians, and all the ones that provide us the, the content for our route. 
And then we had the transversal partners, the facilitators, which were us, the urban planners, the regional development agencies, tourism development agencies, and all of, so these were the brain, let's say, that hold together the vision for the whole route, but which worked very closely with um, local or national anchors of, of multi-layer stakeholder groups, which were established in each country, which brought together all the relevant stakeholders and starting going through this iterative process I mentioned you about, like codifying issues, values, try to understand how this Roman cultural heritage, which is um, sometimes in, in many cases neglected or or not not even known, how it could be valued and transformed into a very attractive cultural route, passing through all of these countries. One more minute. Yes, so we started by identifying all of these stakeholders, try to link them together, try to also, sorry, uh, try to connect them with uh, different stages of the project. And then we started working to them on integrating all of the issues related to Roman cultural heritage into the wider regular, regulatory and policy framework of each country. And we established together with them a set of common, let's say, transnational issues, which were um, transformed into policy recommendations and then worked locally with these groups on local policy recommendations. And in the end, what we have obtained, so you can see here on the left side, these are the results of our uh, field research. We discovered a lot of uh, new segments of Roma routes, which were connected, you can see on the right side, we're connecting with the existing ones and we managed to have a um, continuous path from Romania all the way to Germany into a GIS-based atlas. Then the information from the GIS atlas was included in an um, um, interactive app, Easter app, which is uh, for, meant for the travelers, and which contains information about the route, information about each Roman settlement, and also all the other social infrastructure, socioeconomic infrastructure need, the travelers need, like for instance, restaurants, uh, I don't know, arts and crafts and some other information. And we also have, you can see here on the GIS, we also have the Roman inspired milestones. You can see on the left hand, on the, on the, in the in down, down, which are installed from 50 to 50 kilometers all along the route and which can provide access to all of these digital instruments we have uh, created. We also have the common branding strategy for the whole route. You can see here the process for defining uh, these um, local, uh, local policies. And we also have a documentary of the project, which explains the whole process and uh, brings you closer to Easter route. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia. It's good to see actually this is how complicated the process behind such kind of the CH lab. Uh, regeneration process and how you use different strategies and tools to facilitate that process. Uh, thank you again, Natalia. And uh, uh, as said before, uh, in the interest of time, we'll move all the Q&A sessions to our uh, panel, dis panel discussion part. And in that case, uh, should I actually hand over back to Lee uh, to host our um, review and uh, panel discussion part. Lee, over to you. Thank you, Tianren. So far, we have a, run, a wide range of topics on urban heritage, which has been elaborated by practitioners, policy advisors, um, professionals, academics. Now we move on to the next part of our webinar today, uh, expert review. We are very honored to have four experts who will give their comments and feedbacks to the presentations. Um, the first, uh, um, Expert is Shi Nan, the Secretary General of Urban Planning Society of China. The second uh, expert is uh, uh, Professor Zeynep Ania. She is the chair of GPAM and also ISACOP Scientific Committee member. And third um, expert is Rolf Schutt. Um, he is the board member, member of ISACOP and also board member of International Association of World Heritage Professionals. And fourth expert is Professor Johanna Blocker. She holds the chair of architecture heritage in Brandenburg University, Brandenburg Technic University of Cottbus. So um, my welcome uh, Mr. Shi Nan to give her 
comments and feedbacks. I give his comments and feedbacks. So, Shina, are you here with us? If not, perhaps we can welcome, uh, may I welcome Professor Zeynep? Um, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for organizing this very fruitful Cyber Agora. And uh, many thanks to the valuable contributors. Each of them have been uh, great uh, to listen and learn from. Um, I will try to point out a few things uh, depending upon the presentations. Uh, I would like to uh, first uh, maybe point out to how difficult it is actually to protect cultural heritage because it's, a, it's not a rosy field. It's, it's full of tensions. It's uh, full of challenges. And we have seen in the presentations that there is on the one hand pressures from uh, pressures of growth, pressures of uh, urban growth, as well as economic growth. And on the other side, we have the threat of abandonment that we have seen in the case of shrinking cities. So these are the different uh, sides of the spectrum, the polar ends maybe, uh, along which uh, we are trying to solve the problems. Uh, we are in that case uh, facing uh, the challenge of giving life to certain communities, to certain areas that we have seen, uh, again, in the case of uh, the Star Street, for instance. Uh, but also we have at the other uh, end, the threat of losing the authenticity and, uh, and the genuine identity of places due to sometimes over tourism, sometimes over development and so on. So it's always uh, trying to uh, balance these different forces. And also we have to uh, think about who are uh, we, uh, the, the, who, um, uh, who is benefiting from heritage protection as one of our speakers have rightly imposed the question, whose heritage are we protecting? And all these um, uh, opposing forces sometimes lead to um, the, um, not to the benefit of local population, even though sometimes we're trying to use heritage for employment creation and for the um, uh, well-being and betterment of life in, in the uh, communities of historic places, but sometimes it backfires, as you know, sometimes it displaces people, sometimes it, it uh, endangers local communities and so on. So how do we balance and deal with all these issues is a very difficult task indeed. Um, and also I'd like to point out to one a connection of uh, heritage protection with um, uh, the uh, major crisis that actually we're going through, the climate crisis. It's not only a climate crisis, we have multitude of crises actually. It's a, we have social crisis where we see a lot of disparities, income discrep uh, disparities, inequalities that are becoming much more deepened all over the world. We are seeing a lot of economic uh, inequalities and so on. So all these are pointing out to a turbulent time that uh, we are trying to struggle with as professionals uh, of planning as well as heritage conservation experts. So one of the important points that we might try to connect our thinking about heritage uh, could be uh, what we call recently the post-growth planning or degrowth issues. In other words, in the uh, degrowth and post-growth planning um, agenda, we are talking about reducing consumption, reduce, changing our ways of uh, production and consumption so that we can uh, protect the world actually. As we know, uh, the economic and social progress over the last century has caused massive environmental degradation. And it is now endangering our, the very systems that uh, we base ourselves on. So globally, we have to find ways to decouple actually economic growth 
from well-being and prosperity. And in that sense, uh, we might contribute to this, uh, to saving the planet, so to speak, or um, uh, decrease the speed of the socio-ecological collapse in a way. So in that case, maybe the heritage, heritage protection, heritage sites, heritage practices, traditional ways of doing might teach us something to, uh, uh, to change our uh, overconsumption, overproduction patterns in a more positive way, which we can enhance uh, environmental resource use and enhance biodiversity and so on, which is so much under uh, danger nowadays. Uh, in, in that sense, um, uh, it's maybe uh, important to think about cultural heritage in terms of uh, 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 zero waste, circular economy, and so on, and try to change these lifestyle patterns, learning from the past in a way, and making uh, use of uh, adaptive reuse of buildings uh, definitely uh, contributes to um, the lowering on co of consumption of building materials, for instance. So, um, uh, uh, and also we can foster traditional systems of agriculture, as we have seen very nicely in the case of uh, in the case of Bamberg, uh, where this uh, tradition of gardening has been very nicely regenerated. I wish that we could do a similar thing in my own city in Istanbul, where we have this ancient tradition of urban gardens and so on, in the, and also in the World Heritage Site, which is very much under threat by um, development and you know, sort of modernized thinking of planning areas, which you do not need to do. I mean, overdoing things, opening it up to tourism, opening up uh, to um, uh, some facilities and so on, rather than uh, regenerating that tradition in a more useful and sustainable way that would also uh, contribute not only to the environment, to the heritage, but also to the sustainability of our local communities. So um, I think uh, another important point should be in that sense, uh, asking this question, whose heritage to protect is, I think is a very, very uh, important one. Uh, and um, in that sense, we can adopt a more rights-based uh, approach uh, to cultural heritage. And of course, participation and engaging the local community, defining together the, uh, the meaning of cultural heritage, the setting the common goals and objectives would of course be an ideal way to follow. Okay, I try to be quick so that we don't run out of time. And this is, I can contribute for the time being, maybe afterwards during the panel, I would more say something more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zeynep. We're really looking forward to hear more from you in the panel discussion. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you. And now we are, now uh, the next I would like to invite Rolf Schutt to give his comments. I'm sorry, I, I am in a place which has a bit of a background noise. I hope you can understand me. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, uh, Professor Zainab, for your uh, views, uh, which summarize a lot. I don't need to say much. Uh, I just wanted to point some uh, features about <clears throat> the speaker's inputs. Uh, I love very much um, in Isam's presentation, I know Isam for so many years. He's a very passionate and uh, he loves his culture. And, 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 and um, I think uh, that what they have achieved in, in, in the project that he shows is uh, to bring back the, the city to the citizens, the space that was, uh, let's say, a, a bit wasted, uh, uh, dedicated to the automobile traffic, for, for instance, is an excellent example. And you mentioned several times uh, bringing it back to tourists, but I think what you do is basically you bring it back to, to, to your local uh, citizens. 
Um, uh, in the case of Bamberg, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, gardening is actually, it's proven scientifically that uh, using uh, your hands to, to uh, produce your garden uh, has mental effects that are very positive. And I think uh, if this, and it's actually uh, a use that we have in civilizations uh, since the Middle Ages, uh, you were mentioning in, in the case of Bamberg, um, is something that we must really replicate, not only in Istanbul, in the, in, in the whole world. And it has had also chapters uh, throughout our history, also in Europe, uh, some of them a bit tragic, uh, where, where urban gardening was essential for cities. Um, in the presentation of Martin Kopf, I love very much um, this uh, comparison of the city planning uh, then and today. Uh, it's, it's, uh, many elements are really uh, still valid and this is very outstanding. I think uh, uh, we share uh, still standards uh, across a millennia. Uh, the, the proximity to water or the importance of water, of density, and the horizontal sharing of decision making. And uh, as an element to foster peace and uh, uh, peaceful cohabitation. I love that very much. Um, uh, Elena Patinova, thank you, thank you very much for your really interesting presentation. I think uh, collaboration is uh, one of the key words. Um, Shrinking cities is a reality. We cannot uh, neglect it and we cannot ignore that happens. Uh, it's, it's sometimes also tragic, but uh, I think uh, what we must not forget is that even in shrinking cities, there is a, a proportion of the population which will not migrate and we cannot move them. We have to respect uh, their decisions. Uh, they, they also carry the identity of a place. And they have not only rights, but they also have needs. And we need uh, to put attention to, to these uh, decisions uh, when we deal with uh, shrinking cities. Um, and that uh, goes back to collaboration. Um, we need um, to work as planners and as uh, heritage experts to find solutions. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, Professor Gangi, uh, a uh, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, about the growth patterns of, of, of uh, Xi'an city. I think um, they um, show uh, these this several stages in the growth of the city. They show the impact uh, that uh, cities have when we do infrastructure in investment. And this underlines very many aspects of our responsibility as planners and heritage experts. We have to, um, we cannot forget that our decisions will have a heavy impact potentially uh, and uh, they need careful attention for that reason. Um, so um, my, my, my appeal is also um, to be um, uh, motivators to inspire also the community to participate in these processes because uh, they are very essential for, for these uh, changes to succeed. Uh, in the case of Honorata Grzegowska, uh, very, very interesting uh, database. They, she, she, she showed uh, the Serda plan indeed uh, had such an impact in, in the city of Barcelona and which she started with. And I think um, the database and the classification in keywords that she was showing uh, proves that our roles and our activities are very multi, multidisciplinary, multi-perspective, multi-phase. So the challenge is now to convert this, this data into knowledge, to, 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 to bring this knowledge to, to the, not only to the academia, also to, to, to everyone, to decision makers, politicians um, who are players. Um, and I think um, this, is, this is the next step in, in, our, uh, in our work, the digital, digitalization of our knowledge. And uh, I think, and I hope uh, one day your database will be some kind of digital heritage and uh, congratulations on this work. Uh, and uh, next, uh, Natalia um, was the last presenter. I, I think uh, it also shows how complicated and, and um, Jane was mentioning that uh, is, is our work in, in, in such a long, uh, pattern or such a long uh, access along the Danube, uh, which shows the importance to collaborate 
uh, efficiently because we are actually uh, so often duplicating, triplicating our work, doing parallel things instead of uniting the synergies. But this is politically also sometimes so complicated. I have a bit hope in artificial intelligence and algorithms that may help to, to unite uh, these, these visions. But obviously, this is not the solution. We, we need to work on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rolf. And now I would like to invite Professor Johanna Blocher. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and thank you to all the speakers for your wonderful presentations. Um, what I've done is collected a few themes that I seem uh, that I recognize as important ones and that are shared in some of your um, presentations. Um, and some of this has again has been said already. Um, I noticed the problem of um, well, a lot of us talked about tourism, um, but tourism, of course, is a form of commodification or commoditization um, of heritage. And that, of course, raises tensions with the priority given to authenticity, for example. And Zainab, you mentioned that um, already. Um, the example that we saw was Star Street. And for, with, my, um, with my eyes of a conservationist, um, the result is beautiful, of course, and that was this, it seemed to be the stated goal was to improve the aesthetic effect um, of the street in part for tourists. But that, of course, comes at a, at a cost. The before and after pictures show how radically, how, how thoroughgoing the, the renovation has been. Um, and then I start to wonder about time layers, you know, which layer of time is the one that stays and which layer of time is the one that goes. Um, I worry about things like age value. The street looks very new now. And as a pilgrim to um, Bethlehem, it's partly the ancientness that draws me there. And then the ancientness is not there anymore. So I worry about that. I also worry about, so the cost to the heritage, but also the cost to the locals. And that's a an issue that has been raised. Um, gentrification, I can imagine, is something that happens. Who paid for and who benefits from the, the restoration work? So anyway, that's a topic. Um, gentrification and social benefit um, can go together, like social benefit can involve um, raising people's standards of living, but gentrification is, is, of course, a tipping point where some people benefit at the cost of other people, of course. Um, a, uh, an is another issue, a theme that was raised is this idea of how to support the intangible, the intangible processes that give meaning to tangible heritage. And we have often, or for so many decades, as we all know, um, been concentrated on tangible heritage and intangible heritage, of course, is being more and more recognized as inseparable from these tangible um, witnesses to history. Um, so how to support intangible processes is um, a difficult question. In Bumberg, there are, are wonderful strategies um, involved because that gardening quarter is not worth anything as tangible heritage or not really, or it's worth something, it's, it has a different, a very different value if the gardening practices are not um, present anymore. So there's that, how to support those practices, but again, without forcing those practices, um, without artificially keeping them alive, which is also would also detract from authenticity, um, obviously, and also at the same time, um, without um, trying to hinder other kinds of intangible practices, which may have their own form of authenticity. So that's a complicated um, problem. In Bamberg, of course, as I mean, I spent many years in Bamberg, so I understand this um, problem of trying to channel or to steer traffic of, of tourism to steer it in a certain direction, but also just to channel people's attention. Where does attention get um, paid? And that can be very difficult, of course, a real channel, uh, a real um, challenge. And sometimes you have this problem, like in Bamberg, where there's not enough attention um, in one area and too much um, in another. And that's a real challenge, um, of course. Um, Bamberg, but also other examples raise, raise the issue of the climate crisis, um, climate crisis and energy um, crisis. Um, and in Bamberg, the um, gardening, and this is something that I hope is, a, is an effect of all heritage, that it helps us to um, imagine alternatives to the way we do things today. Um, alternatives that were possible and happened in the past, and that means that they are perhaps possible in the, in the future as well. Um, the climate crisis, also the energy crisis, as a more recent um, crisis we've been through, that perhaps these, this, the, this will help um, channel more attention towards um, small scale gardening um, techniques, um, towards traditional gardening techniques that use fewer resources, um, perhaps. Um, less water, perhaps, or less, um, less fertilizer, what, what have you. 
Um, and that was, I found that so interesting um, in connection with the presentation on um, urbanitarian that that your students grow their own food, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a master's program in what was it called again? Bio um, bio bio urbanism. I forget. Bio cities, bio cities, yeah. Yes, yes, bio cities. <laughs> bio cities, and to the bio city belongs um, growing your own food, um, perhaps, right? And Bamberg is a great example of that. Um, the interests of present communities versus the interests of stakeholders in pastness. We, as heritage people, are all um, interested in. We have a we have a stake in pastness, but not everyone has that or recognizes it as a as a priority and i wonder this will have to be an, an open question can be, perhaps be answered later in the um in the general discussion um when we're talking about vincha um you showed in your first slide um the um the the illegal settlement that is atop the site right and i wonder um I, i'd be curious to know about what the fate of that um, settlement is uh, given that this spectacular new archaeological find lies right beneath it um, and whether there's an or uh, there's a, um, a negotiation process about who's who to whom does that site now belong right to the people who live there or to the people thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago who lived there right and our interest in them Okay, I'm almost done through my uh, my topics here. Um, in general, coming back to the idea of climate and energy crises, um, that point was raised. How can um, heritage from the past be an example for us today? What can we learn from it for the crises that we're experiencing today and the challenges that we're experiencing today? Um, Vincha is a particularly interesting example, I find, because you, you you placed some emphasis on the idea of this society being very egalitarian um, and it being a society um, without, a, without a clear hierarchy um, and also a society where conflict was not particularly pre um, prevalent, it seems, as far as we know so far, right? And I wonder whether that can be a kind of a useful uh, heritage, giving us examples, again, um, examples for alternatives to the way that we do things um, today, alternatives to nationalism or alternatives to conflict in terms of um, armed conflict and, and war and so on. At the same time, though, Vincha um, is, an, um, is an interesting example because now Serbia has a um, a site where we can say this is the ours is the oldest and ours is the you know and that seems to me to be uh, potentially linked to a great deal of national pride perhaps even nationalist pride just 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 saying just uh just thinking about these kinds of um, topics um shrinking cities is belongs perhaps also to this um, thematic care um uh, category. Um, you mentioned um, degrowth, and that's exactly what occurred to me, um, this idea that um, um, that heritage is, and it's, it's a problem, that heritage is often the first thing that gets demolished um, because newer buildings, people are reluctant to knock down buildings that were just built two, two decades ago or so, right? And things that were built hundreds of years ago and perhaps are showing their age are the first things maybe to get knocked down. And there, I have a colleague here in Bum, um, in Bamberg, in, in uh, Cottbus, um, who has studied this in using the example of Detroit, which you mentioned um, that Detroit is being hollowed out from the middle um, and there's it's turning into a ring, sort of a ring city with a dead center. Um, and that when we think about shrinking cities perhaps and the need to the need to make them smaller, make cities smaller, that perhaps we should start thinking about reducing from the outside in that is from the new towards the old, rather from, from the inside out, like destroying the old first uh, and um, keeping the new. So that's interesting. And the last thing I'll mention is, um, the or underline, is the need for cooperation and exchange and networks, which is why we're all here. Um, and um, Urbanitarian is, of course, a great uh, example of that. Um, in order to learn from each other, in order to develop the best practices um, that we're, we need to know what each other is doing and what you learn from each other's um, expertise. Multi-level government um, approaches, um, cross-sectoral um, approaches, of course, um, as well. Um, another question that can be maybe answered in the, uh, in the larger discussion is for a urbanitarian, is it always and only best practice examples that are included in the database? Or do you have also worst practice examples, which are often just as informative? Um, what not to do, 
um, in case someone is considering uh, building another Pruitt Igo, for example, if that means anything to you in uh, in St. Louis. And in case somebody has that brilliant idea, then they could learn perhaps um, that that is, but also raises the question whether um, oh. Connected with Pruitt Igo, whether the um, whether the problem there was a design problem or a totally other kind of problem, and I don't think it was an urban design problem at Pruitt Igo. I think it was a totally different kind of problem. So we have to we have to nuance when we're comparing um, urban plans whether the urban plan is the thing that is the key either to success or to failure in a in a certain um, development. Good. Sorry. I'll leave it. I'll leave it <laughs> yeah. <at that. laughs> So with your words, you mentioned in the big discussion. So now I hand over to Zabina for the bigger discussion and we still have a chance to hear more from you. Thank you, Zabina, yeah. please. Thank you, Lee. Hi, everyone. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon. I just want to make, a, so we are a little bit late with the schedule. We still have 20 minutes and we're going to try to do the best uh, that we can with them. I just want to have a very quick wrap up of what we've seen and how I interpret what we've seen. Um, I think that uh, this may be one of the most uh, impactful uh, cyber agoras that we had strictly from the perspective of looking to towards heritage from very different lenses. And we looked at the what. Uh, the heritage typologies versus the community involvement. We had two presentations on this right at the beginning, uh, looking at the uh, the Bethlehem uh, Star Street revitalization and using horticulture, which is a much softer and nature-oriented approach to conserving and reinterpreting heritage. And then we looked at the storytelling and the drivers of reinterpreting the past. And this was a very inspiring a set of three presentations from, uh, we looked at Vincha and at what, what cultural heritage can mean for shrinking cities, as well as a presentation from the Third Front Movement in, in, in China. And I think all of these are really illustrating the different pathways that we can take as uh, specialists to highlight um, the story behind the heritage and how we identify with heritage at uh, at local level and how we can you know ensure that we can we can communicate that to the community and to the tourists and then of course we also looked at the how uh, the mechanisms doing the great heritage um in terms of management, the use of data, uh, data-driven decision-making, technology models, and of course, uh, policy-making instruments. So the presentations of Honorata and Natalia. Now, the roundtable uh, initially uh, was, so the key question that I, I would like to ask uh, the participants in the panel is, um, what can we do as planners? What is our key role? Are we uh, facilitators? Are we uh, leaders? Are we, um, what's what's really the focus of our work in terms of revitalizing, reinterpreting and using um, cultural heritage as a driver for our communities? Um, this is one question, and then of course, uh, please use the chat box for all the, of the people, pat, uh, you know, patching in today, uh, and you know, write down your own questions, and we are going to uh, to take them. So this is an open question. We start easy. Who wants to go first? Okay, uh, I can. I can say. Okay. <laughs> so, so Honorata think, and then Diana. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think as urban planners, urban designers, we already have so many roles <laughs> that, uh, you know, talking from my perspective, talking with a sociologist, talking with the city, with politicians, talking with inhabitants, thinking about the traffic, the mobility, everything. So I think we already have enough of the roles. What I think we are missing is the knowledge. That's why I go back to what, to what I do, which is urbanitarian, because um, I think our schedules are so busy that we all the time use the same examples and we don't even, you know, have time in hand to look for this heritage. And I can tell you from the experience, I am involved in urbanitarian since many years. Um, and first of all, it was a library for contemporary projects, examples. Then it was for a moment for future projects because we were thinking, okay, this ones will be the best ones. And we ended up finding out after searching more than thousands urban scale projects that 
the best what we can learn is from the previous project, so from the heritage project. And this is what actually we are focusing more on now, especially you can see after the COVID where everyone, you know, everyone knows that we need open space, we have to eat healthy, we need a community to survive. And all these aspects of urban scale projects we find in the, in the history no? in, and in the past. That's why this is a goal to this knowledge that we can find in the heritage in urban planning. It's really gold. And I know from my experience from the project that I did in Asia, here in Europe, in Africa, urban planners and, and urban designers are really keen to know more. Uh, but really not everyone has time to, to now read a lot of books and, or search, especially some projects. The most in, interesting projects, we cannot find articles about this project. They are not seen anywhere in the, in the internet. So I think we have to produce more knowledge and we have to produce more articles, especially if we want that artificial intelligence reply to us later. First, we have to write it and we have to give this information to the artificial intelligence. So we have a lot of a lot of articles to write and a lot of examples to show so that in a few years, AI can reply us with a good answer. Thank you, Honorata. So basically, uh, what we need is to make best practices more, access more accessible take them out there and discuss them with professionals like us and with other types of professionals. And what I also think is that this is, it needs maybe to be bridged with uh, the actual bottom up perspective of heritage, because I think that cultural heritage is kind of like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder as much as it is in some parameters that are uh, universally accepted in terms of proportions, in terms of, of, of uh, styles and so on and so forth. But it's still also a little bit of what you're making out of it or what the local community is making out of it and how they identify and how they integrate that within their own framework of values. So it's a little bit of a, you know, outside in and inside out approach that we need to uh, to understand, you know, from the lens of the place. So thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass uh, the microphone to Diana, if she's here. Yes, I'm there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, so um, the bottom up idea is also, in, in my opinion, um, one of the ways to go because um, as a small example from Bamberg here, um, when we have redone the, the um, Gardner's Museum, which is, um, uh, which is uh, still running by um, and the Gardner's Association, of course, the Gardner's were very skeptical what we are doing to their museum. And if you um, take it in a larger context to their district, um, needs a lot of trust on a personal level, not just like an authority being like, um, I know how it's done, uh, let me handle it and get out of the way. So that's not the approach. You have to, to, to really connect on a personal level to, to build up trust um, and not not only for this one project you are doing together um, to work on that in the future too uh, together on an on a on a on a, on a safe future for the heritage and community involvement is is a key for that if you right. yeah i'm sorry <laughs> i didn't want to take too yeah. much time for it <laughs> So I think that, yeah, you're totally right. And trust-based systems are, I think, the building block of actually developing or redeveloping cultural heritage. And this brings me to the idea that we really do not have uh, the silver bullet in terms of how we are managing the vertical vertical and horizontal governance of managing this these properties and this heritage. And some of them are public, some of them are private. Uh, we are talking about, for example, regional networks of heritage that could benefit from a collective, uh, you know, storytelling and a collective revitalization. So how do we do that? How do we manage these, uh, these potentials with the instruments that we have so far? And I think Natalia has her microphone uh, on and maybe she can tell us some things about this. Yeah, so what I wanted to say is that in my opinion, it is very important for us to try as much as we can to be modest and to be observers, because I think our tendency as specialists is to 
okay so we see a context and we start reflecting on them we, we start um um reflecting some some visions which are based on our experience and what on what we learned so far on what we know would be proper for that for that specific context but and i think it's very hard not to be biased when you when you analyze a context and try to understand the multiple perspectives in in that perspective so i think it's very important to get one step back bring try to bring all of these people together because we as urban planners we are aware of all of these types of of dynamics which are affecting uh, or or improving a territory and try to bring all of these people together and extract some um essential aspects from what they are complaining about what they are what they are saying there and try to combine them and to 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 somehow feel the the spirit of of the contemporary society and align the future function of of the heritage site with this spirit i would say i think it's very important mm -hmm. because we might be we might be biased and i think that even if we read a lot we still have this theoretical background which is somehow making us see things sometimes with a narrow narrow view even if we are planners and we are very complex i think we are we should be more modest somehow and observing a lot agreed and i think that this is something that uh some of the things that we are maybe not focusing on is the importance of the communities to be prideful in their heritage and to be prideful in their cities. And uh, this may be something that can reverse the trends of depopulation and it can make communities um, be become reattached their places. And I want to ask Elena what she thinks about this, because her presentation was exactly on the topic of the shrinking cities and cultural heritage. Thank you. Actually, I would like just to remind that maybe it's difficult to speak about the universal role of urban planners because it depends very much on context and many contexts, unfortunately, still remains quite highly technician uh, profession, which is uh, hardly can impact somehow on decision making or participation process and so on. But anyway, I see uh, and from the presentation, for me, it becomes maybe even more evident that the most important role of planners in any context is the communicative role because it creates a communication <clears throat> between different stakeholders, between different interests, between different scales from global to local, between different theory and practice. So it's really uh, our force that we would like, we, we, we can introduce even in the most, most difficult context. And of course, uh, this discussion uh, today, you bring also all these questions about climate change and global challenges that sh we should face and how it affects the local uh, uh, aspects of urban development. All these things are very important in terms of communication, again, between best and worst practices, be between different experience. And in this communication, maybe our uh, role, our challenge is to be less invasive i don't know <laughs> to be less um in, yes uh, to impact less and to listen more and to bring more things together this this is my opinion thank you thank you elena uh, I, I i think if i remember correctly the first presentation the one of isam uh it had many many slides of people getting really down to the business and working together and workshops involving the community. And I wanted to, to, to ask Isam, uh, what in your in your experience, like working on the project in Bethlehem, what were the biggest impact engaging techniques and what have you learned from this process of really involving the usual citizens in the, in the process of revitalization of heritage? Well, Working in dynamic city is not an easy task and need a lot of attention to the community desire and interest. But at the same time, we have to work on raising their awareness about what will be, uh, what could be uh, goals of such a project. Because when we start working in the Star Street, where a lot of citizens have different interests uh, according to their objectives of this project. For example, some people were in favor of having pedestrian street, the other were against having pedestrian street. So we have to also to find a balance between 
all sectors and their entrance of the project. People who are working in field of tourism have specific entrance and people who are not working in the tourism have other interests. So mm -hmm. urban planners here have to find a balance between the all sectors interest and at the same time to work what is better could be for local community, for the site and for heritage. It's not an easy task and always there are some complaints, but we have to find what will be the, uh, the entrance for the majority of the society. Thank you. Um, I found very interesting the presentation of Mr. Tan, and I would like to ask him to maybe share with us a little bit the, the, the way in which he sees the possibilities of keeping alive some of the techniques, some of the cultures, some of the the, the approaches to you know uh, this um, industrial uh, modernist uh, way of living, and how that translates into modern modern time society. How can that, how can that still be you know kept in a in a in a very close um, connection to 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 life right now for the citizens, and how can you build on that in the future? Uh, you're, I think you're muted, so there yeah. we go. Uh, I think uh, the citizen living in the uh, third front movement uh, cities uh, uh, have a memory of that, that, that uh, period of, uh, because they have a uh, uh, dilated nail, uh, nail, uh, their life and the nail uh, generations uh, to uh, uh, so softly. Uh, socialist uh, construction, but now they have a good memory. So we should uh, uh, respect their the spirit value and make them live better. So at the same time, when the shrinking city development, so many factories has uh, uh, decreased and uh, and that they destroyed. So maybe or I think um, we should focus on the current uh, situation and uh, mm -hmm. uh, evaluate their value to give their different uh, uh, route to uh, conservation the heritage or the uh, re uh, adaptive reuse the heritage. And at the same time, some long, uh, some factory or some uh, beauty uh, environment without uh, uh, value enough, maybe you could uh, mm -hmm. transform and uh, other uh, other function. Maybe for example, for example, then the uh, uh, Broomfield uh, development. So maybe transfer to the uh, innovation, cultural, or, or other uh, other re recreation park for the cities. So I think. Uh, uh, in, uh, we should, uh, according to a different uh, situation, to make a different uh, uh, catalog. Uh, yeah. Mm, exactly. I think that there are a lot of best practices going back to best practices in the uh, uh, in the library of of projects. I think there are a lot of best practices of adaptive reuse with uh, with the challenge of of being able to keep a radiography of the past that is accessible to people of, of the present, but also to be able to reinterpret that heritage from several lenses that are more sustainable, uh, more people oriented, maybe educational functions, maybe other things that help you know. Um, gather the community around or develop new forms of economy. So also maybe using nature-based solutions or other techniques to anchor or, or reinterpret the heritage in context, always in context, because we're not just looking at the, the buildings, we're looking at the city itself and the heritage within, you know, the, the, the whole city story. Um, last but not least, I think, <laughs> I uh, I wanted to ask. So, Martin, your presentation was extremely inspiring. I found out so many new things. Uh, now, my question is, what's next for Vincha? Because is this is uh, it's really my only question. I want I want to know. Okay. So, I, I, and but I'll answer some of the questions that were raised in the in the notes. First of all, 
um, the process of reclamation of the properties um, owned by private people on illegally occupied land, uh, we've gone through a reappropriation process. And I'm told that uh, everyone has been paid to be resettled somewhere else. And the most important part of it is that actually we're now doing a, a series of kind of community workshops, both to make clear about the opportunities, economic opportunities of the site, but also we're building a new riverfront park. So all of the properties that had blocked access to the river for the communities of Incha will now not be able to do that. And the community is looking forward to getting access to their river back. Um, the other question which I thought was interesting around um, Venture or heritage as a lesson, we've been using Venture as a blueprint for not necessarily for the answers, but for the kind of questions that humanity has, uh, you know, how to feed yourselves, how to live um, together in a kind of in a cohesive community. One of the interesting things I didn't say is that they also believe one of one of the strands of thought about Venture is that this massive community finally came together because it, they were refugees from the flooding of the Black Sea. So it even raises questions around how you integrate mm. refugee communities. It, it, it's fascinating for that. Therefore, the big thing really is that this new, um, this new complex of a scientific center, which will hopefully become a, a center of research into the Neolithic era, uh, visitors and museum, a visitor uh, center and museum, which will um, become a tourism attraction for the, uh, the whole of the region. Um, we're just looking at some of the Neolithic heritage site numbers from around Europe. And I mean, we don't have anything at the moment. We're hoping that we can try and regenerate that. Um, we're building a Neolithic village at the site. It, it allows us to connect with so many opportunities for uh, economic and social growth that, uh, you know, we, we are trying to integrate all of those things together. But we've also done things like in, uh, we've built a new um, uh, marina pier next to the river so that we can go onto the tour boat um, routes that come down the Danube. And we've created a VR exhibition and we've created a new web. So we're trying to do it in a fairly integrated way that will make venture then become, uh, you know, a, a something that is no longer unknown by the general public, but something that is widely known. But just to say, um, we often get asked this as Serbians about the kind of nationalistic elements of this. The, the genetics just doesn't hold water with that. So the DNA testing, it shows, you know, this is a completely different group of people. We can't claim that this is Serbia. Um, and frankly, the fact that this is a trans-Balkan um, culture that spreads all along the Danube and its tributary rivers really for me is is part of the excitement of this process because it really just shows that we're all in it together mm. um, and another little aside I'd love to have time to is Lipinski Vir the old culture that I rushed through at the end the genetic record of that shows that it's ex the exact time in history when migrants from the Middle East joined hunter-gatherer societies in Europe and within a generation, they had shared cultural practices and behaviors. Um, it, this shows that Europe was not owned by anybody, frankly. And it's really just a great way of us integrating new thinking about how heritage and culture works together. And as I said, and they were planned towns. They were laid out properly so that people could live there effectively. I think it's a great lesson. It's a fantastic lesson and we need it right now because as you said we're talking about a time in which we struggle with issues of migrant integration is really the understanding of of needing to be more open of needing to be more accepting of needing to fold into our uh cities new people that come with new ideas that come with with new heritage not to erase anything but to enrich and as planners, I think that we are also, uh, we are not architects in the sense that we do not have one beneficiary, we do not cater to one interest, we are basically civil servants, we are serving communities and cities all together. And Zeynep uh, posed a question here in chat, uh, how does or should the planner reconcile competing interests? What kinds of criteria can we employ? And is it enough to cater to the needs and interests of the majority? How about the minority or the disadvantaged groups who are not able to strongly state their interests and needs? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> so uh, yes, um, uh, before Zeynep also um, 
another participant want to address comments and questions. So although we are lagging behind the time schedule, I don't want to miss the chance to inviting our participants to talk. So oh, perhaps yes. I can invite uh, Francisco de la Vega from Mexico to give his comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for, uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to leave a concept to the speakers of this ISOCARP, an international association of world heritage professionals. Uh, the concept comes mostly from UNESCO and, in the, uh, and uh, the area of World Heritage Convention, and also from experts in the subject matter of conservation of historic cities. And is the following. I recommend, I recommend to the speakers the, the importance of having periodically updated indicators that allow the evaluation of the state of sustainable conservation of their historic cities. With regard to the urban scale as a heritage category, it is important to point out that in monitoring the state of conservation of cities or historic centers, it is an, an unavoidable task that is rarely addressed in a continuous and systematic way. Therefore, it is not clear that there are methods or indicators so that in an objective and comparable way arrive at situation diagnosis that allow evaluating the changes developed over time. With regard or regarding the urban scale, as a patrimony category, it is evident that the indicators must contemplate several aspects. Example of this is territorial, urban, architectural, social, and economic, all of which requires an interdisciplinary task. Regarding the urban, Regarding the urban scale, the deepening of the research and above all the practice in the application of these systems of indicators will be an instrument for their validation and eventual adjustments which will allow arriving at the possibility of a systematic and continuous monitoring of our cities and historical centers. For your attention, thank you very much. We thank you as well. Um, if there are any comments on the intervention on me, or maybe on, uh, on Zainab's questions, Natalia, please. Yes, yes, I wanted to say something. Um, so in my opinion, what should be done in the case of the more vulnerable groups, which are, are not, don't, don't have the strength maybe or the, or the courage to express their needs, maybe it would be good to, to go for the young girl or for the Serda approach, to be an observer, try to get to, to somehow with, without disturbing them to observe the behavior of, of the citizens, try to, uh, to understand their attitudes towards a different situation on, on, or another. And then if possible, try to connect with them as, as um, um, what, oh, I forgot the name, as our colleague said from, from Bamberg, sorry, she's not here anymore. I don't see her. Um, Diana, sorry, as Diana said in the beginning, so try to connect with them if possible, but if this is true intrusive, I think the observation and this young, I, young girl comes in my mind, this observation approach would be the most appropriate and try to subtly integrate their um, concerns or their needs into the new design. I think it's also a question of trust. 
Whenever we work as planners with a community, sometimes we work as consultants, we get parachuted into a context, we gather some stakeholders, and uh, we try to have a participatory process. But I think that the most difficult thing is not a, an, it's not something that costs in terms of you know financial investment, it's something that costs in terms of time and understanding. And you need to launch these processes that are not built over a month, they're not built over six, six months, they're built over years and years of of creating the practice of, of talking to people and establishing the trust and demonstrating to them on and on that you are, you know, a listener, you're also an antenna for their ideas, and you also set up the right arena for their, uh, you know, opinions and needs and wants to come to you as a city administration and, 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 and for your responsibility to to implement them in a way that that fosters and that you know creates that trust on and on so it's not easy it's really not easy uh it's not easy because we're so used right now to you to uh make use of uh facebook social media to reach out these citizens but most of them are not you know, participating in this uh, e uh, society because they cannot afford it, and this means that it is a responsibility to go out of our own bubbles and 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 go visit them where they live. Actually, because this is the only way that you can uh, you can ensure that you you create uh, this link, this bridge in a safe space, uh, and not you know ask them to come to you. It's the mountain that has to go to Muhammad in this situation, I think. Um, I think we're uh, a little bit over time here, uh, but it was such a great discussion and maybe we can have a, a follow-up on specifically uh, this topic because there are so many other things to discuss. And uh, I think, yes, well, Linda asks us if the recording will be available somewhere. I think the Secretariat can answer this question. We have live streamed on Facebook, so it may be available afterwards for viewing there anyway. And in closing, I just want to uh, share two things with you. It's just two slides, one thing, two slides. Um, we really hope that if you've enjoyed uh, the Cyber Agora right now, you are considering joining us for the 59th Congress of Isaac Carp that is taking place in October in Toronto, in Canada, together with the Fifth Urban Economy Forum. It is a historic partnership between Isaac Carp and a private actor that looks at uh, how to fund um, urban intervention. So our uh, title for this Congress is for Climate Action and Urban Finance, Climate Responsive Planning for Equitable Places and Communities. The registration is open. It's going to take place in the Daniel Spectrum and World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park. And we really hope for you to uh, come join us, review what we have to offer, our tracks, our ideas, uh, and the possibilities to get involved and support the Congress at the dedicated page that is toronto2023.isocarp.org, or just, you know, uh, visit our page and uh, keep in touch with us and what we do as Isocarp. Uh, we thank very much to our partners today. I think this was, again, it's, to my understanding, it is a historic first partnership between the ISACARP and the International Association of World Heritage Professionals. And I would like to thank the representatives here and the director, uh, Ms. Patricia Albert. Thank you for, for joining us today. And thanks to all participants. Um, yeah. I think that we can close here. I am going to pass the microphone to Lee uh, if she wants to say something in closing and to thank you very much for your attention and active participation. I can say no more things only to say thank you for staying with, us, uh, staying with us. Thank you. Hope to see you next time in other webinars in our Congress in Toronto.